What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So just when you thought Konami couldn't fall any lower in gamers' eyes after what they did with Metal Gear Survive and a bunch of other things, turns out they decided it, was, it would be a good idea to celebrate the Castlevania 35th anniversary with NFTs and well, they got quite the reaction online. We're gonna go over all of that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about the Nintendo Switch eShop and a big New Year sale that is currently going on with some pretty good discounts. And we're also gonna be talking about E3 2022 because we did get an update for how things are gonna be run this year. Guys, if you enjoyed these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below and ring that notification bell so you can keep up to date with all the uploads here on the channel. And we're gonna start today with Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Have to say it kind of slow on YouTube here, but if you've ever wondered what a newer Jet Set radio game would look like in 2022, this is it. It was shown off during an Indie World presentation and it caught a lot of people's attention because of how similar it looked to the Jet Set Radio series. And it's kind of like that spiritual successor. Well, they did release a new trailer. And if you've ever wondered, what would Jet Set Radio be like? With skateboards and BMX bikes, they answered it here. You can see it. And uh, this game, every time they show it, looks better and better. I am really looking forward to this game. It's from Team Reptile and it's slated for 2022. We know it is coming to the Switch and it is currently listed on Steam. We're expecting it on other platforms as well. It might be a timed exclusive uh, exclusivity deal on the Switch currently, but either way, this game looks like a ton of fun. And also, I mean, I like Jet Set Radio or Jet Ride Radio, Radio on the Dreamcast. Really enjoyed Jet Set Radio Future on the Xbox. So I'm a bit partial to what, I, what I'm seeing here right now. But so far, it looks pretty good. And here's hoping it's coming out sooner rather than later in 2022. Also, I have some good news for a lot of you classic JRPG fans, especially if you enjoyed something like Octopath Traveler or Bravely Default 2, or you're looking forward to Triangle Strategy. That's all from Team Asano. And it looks like they're gearing up for even more announcements and releases this year. We can see this tweet that was posted up saying, Happy New Year, I'm starting work today. In addition to the Triangle, we are planning to announce and release multiple titles this year. Please pay attention. And this is great, obviously, for anyone who likes those more classic JRPG experiences, because if you look around, a lot of game series now that we've known as traditional RPGs from maybe even like the PS1 or the PS2 are working more towards action RPG setups. I mean, Final Fantasy is, is one of the best examples. We heard that the next Dragon Quest game, which is years off, I'm sure, sounds like they're gonna have to make some pretty big changes themselves for gameplay and tells me they're probably gonna head towards an action RPG setup there. But Team Asano, I mean, they are as traditional as it gets. You played Triangle Strategy or Project Triangle Strategy when they released the demo and yeah, that feels like old school Final Fantasy Tactics which the, with the HD 2D visuals and I'm all for that. Bravely Default 2 looked more current with its visuals, but still retained the like traditional JRPG setup with the job system and, and all of that. So I'm excited what they have in store for us this year. I mean, Triangle Strategy looks great. We've played it, looking forward that, to that release, but I'm glad that Team Asano seems to be like full speed ahead with more and more releases because while the action RPG stuff, that's fun, still like to have it mixed in with some of these more traditional experiences. Oh, and we had just talked about Ghost of Tsushima crossing 8 million copies sold, which is great for a new IP. Sony seems very happy with it. However, it does appear that Days Gone actually sold that many copies as well, which is strange because Sony didn't seem as happy with that game. We can see this posted up by Jeff Ross saying, at the time I left Sony, Days Gone had been out for a year and a half and a month and sold over 8 million copies. It's since gone on to sell more and then a million plus on Steam. Local studio management always made us feel like it was a big disappointment. So it's not a disappointment, I guess, from the sales aspect because Ghost Tsushima Sony seems pretty happy with that. So you look around and say, well, what else could it be? Maybe a rocky development that didn't go that well, but God of War, you know, pretty rocky development. We saw that in full documentary format. Otherwise, I guess the reviews, Sony seems to want to have their releases review well and be this big thing when it comes out. You can, you're guaranteed, okay, PlayStation Studios, you see the logo, that means quality, I'm expecting. 85, 90, 95 on Metacritic. And unfortunately, Days Gone just did not get there. But it, Sony Bend is working on something else. And I am curious to see what that is going to be. Unfortunately, while Days Gone sold well enough, that 
isn't enough for Sony to do a sequel despite pff, potentially almost 10 million copies. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Konami and the Castlevania 35th anniversary. There's a lot of cool things you could do for a series that's been around for 35 years. That is quite the accomplishment. You could announce a brand new big game that's coming out. That'd be really exciting stuff. Merchandise, that'd be great for Castlevania fans. New stuff to collect there. Maybe a new series. Or you could do what Konami did and announce NFTs, which... What? Konami's so weird, but here, here's the page they posted up over on their website. It's Konami Memorial NFT, and we're gonna come back to that because, uh... I, I don't think this is gonna be the only series that is going on this page, but Castlevania 35th anniversary NFT. They even use a little font there for Castlevania for NFT. Very, very, very good, Konami, really crossing all the T's there. It appears they do have a schedule set up for an auction around this, January 12th to the, the 14th. And then we can see the list of NFTs on sale. Some of them are like little video clips and they have one that's like highlights. Then they do just have some that are just, pixel art and the idea here these being non-fungible tokens and they're supposed to be digital receipts one-of-a-kind pieces they're going to auction them off and then I, I guess the highest bidder gets a, a digital receipt for any one of these nfts that they've posted up here for the castlevania series through the 35 years of it existing also it is pretty funny because they have to do this little trademark thing right underneath of those nfts that says trademarks are property of their respective owners. Family, computer, Nintendo Entertainment System are trademarks of Nintendo. Nintendo's probably, might be a little annoyed that they're on there with NFTs. I mean, obviously it's not Nintendo, but like, it's still posted up right underneath of the, of the NFTs, which there's copyright, trademark laws, all of that, I'm sure. But yeah, what a way to celebrate the Castlevania 35th anniversary. Who needs games? There are NFTs to be selling here, right? And uh, these companies, I've, I told you guys this, Square was very open that they are looking into NFTs, Metaverse, Ubisoft is doing it. And I'm gonna tell you now, more and more companies are going to be doing this. And I mentioned the way that this is drawn up on this page, this isn't gonna be the only series that ends up here for NFTs with Konami. Get ready for the Metal Gear NFTs. Get ready for the Contra NFTs. Think about anything that Konami has rights to and that they can dress up as some sort of anniversary or something with NFTs they're probably gonna do it because of the inflated market now with this. I feel like a lot of these companies figure they can do this NFT thing and just get money out of nowhere. And they might be right currently, but it still is a market that I think is waiting to just completely burst. And that's not to mention the backlash these companies keep getting whenever they talk about NFTs, because for a lot of gamers right now that are buying you know, you know the, these larger AAA experiences, they kind of look around and say, well, what do we need NFTs for exactly in these games? We've talked about the digital property and ownership when it comes to the game itself, where maybe you could trade it or sell it or any of that, off of these different storefronts, which Tendo, Microsoft, and Sony don't want that, I'll tell you that now. So we're all trying to envision why these companies want to inject NFTs into these games, and it's just money. Like, it's as basic as that. This is just Konami thinking, wow, this, this looks like a good way for us to make a lot of money, and I'm gonna be curious to see how well these actually sell, and yeah, if it's worth selling out Castlevania's 35th anniversary for it. Now, if you were looking for an actual way to celebrate Castlevania's 35th anniversary, you can see this here from Limited Run Games. With a game, who would have thought? <laughs> Castlevania Requiem Ultimate Edition features the classic edition contents, plus exclusive Castlevania memorabilia you won't want to miss. Six week open pre-orders to start January 14th, and it looks good. Looks like there's a lot of content there, exciting stuff for Castlevania fans. So while these NFTs are, they're gonna be auctioned off, I'll follow them because I'm just curious to see if they if they do sell and how much they sell for. There you go, at least we have a game of some kind to buy for the Castlevania anniversary. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only thing that Konami will do, but wow, what a way to start. An anniversary, which should be a big anniversary for, for like one of their biggest franchises with NFTs. Next up, let's talk about the big New Year sale that is currently live on the Switch eShop. And there are a lot of games on sale right now. Several publishers had their different pages go live all at the same time. And we'll move over here to the sales and deals page on Nintendo's eShop, their website. And I'll leave a link down below in the sources if you wanted to go through them yourselves. And 
We'll start here at the top with the Bethesda New Year's Sale. These are all live now, and it appears most of them are going to be running until uh, basically the, the 17th. So plenty of time, actually, to at least take a look around and see if there's anything good here, especially if you just got a Switch. Uh, a lot to, to look into on this one. But like you can see Bethesda, a lot of Doom titles. I mean, Doom 64, $2.49. That, that's pretty awesome. Doom 2016 is $20. So if you're looking to have some Doom on the go, that's another good one there as well. Also have to shout out Quake, by the way, $6.99. MVG helped get that, that game over onto the Switch. So make sure you check that one out there. Moving down to Chucklefish, they do have Eastward on sale. It's not like a massive discount. It's $22.49 but Eastward is an awesome game, certainly worth checking out there. Wargroove down to $10 is pretty good. And we have Devolver Digital with quite a few of their titles on sale. That does include Carry On that people really enjoyed, $11.99. My Friend Pedro, $7.99. And I have to absolutely vouch for The Messenger, $7.99 as what is I think one of the best 2D platformers I've played in a while. Moving over to 2K sale, they do have Civilization VI down to $9. XCOM 2 collection at $12.49. They do have several of their Borderlands titles, the Handsome Collection, as well as Game of the Year edition on sale. Bioshock, the collection, $20. And is that WWE 2K18? Wait a minute, hold, hold on. WWE 2K18 is normally $60 and it's been marked down to $19.79. That is absolutely incredible. Now you have to decide. I mean, do you get Bioshock the Collection or WW2K18? This this is a tough one. We also have Ubisoft with Child of Light Ultimate Edition at $5. Rayman Legends Definitive Edition at $10. You know, Starlink at $12. I think is worth a pickup on the Switch specifically because it does have that Star Fox content that I think made the Switch version the best version overall. Certainly worth checking that out though at $12. Bandai Namco has, uh, again, quite the sale going on here. Several of their titles, including Katamari Damacy Reroll at $7.49. They have Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch at $10. They have the second one. That's like the Prince's Edition though at $42. So I still prefer the first Nino Kuni Cooney at 10 bucks. I think that's a good pickup there. Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Complete Edition, which is a very good uh, uh, Digimon JRPG style game, $14.99. God Eater 3, $9.59. Sword Art Online Hollow Realization at $7.49. Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition, $12.49. And then you do have Dragon Ball Z Kakarot and a new Power Awakened set down to $35.99. And even beyond all this, there are several more titles on on sale. So leave some suggestions down below in the comments, especially for people who just got a Switch over the holidays and they're looking to start their collection off right. Next up, let's talk about the Switch sales in Japan for the entirety of 2021. And we've pretty much talked about the Switch's dominance anytime the Famitsu sales starts come up in Japan, because it's pretty obvious. Half the time, we look at the top 10 and it's all Switch titles. We'll look at the little pie chart. It's like 98% Switch sales completely, even versus like the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox and 3DS. You throw it all in there, it's like this little sliver versus the rest of the pie that's all the Switch. But if we take a look at the cumulative sales for 2021, once again, it's a large, it's a pie with the large section being the Switch. We can see this list here. It was posted up by Nintendo Life, but these figures were shared by Famitsu and game, uh, GamesIndustry.biz with the Switch. Number one, 5.3 million units. Look at the next slot below that. The PlayStation 5, ni uh, 942,000 units. Yes, it, it is that much of a disparity between one and two with the Switch leading the way. PlayStation 4, 103,000 units. That actually outsold the Xbox Series X and S throughout 2021. Although, as we got further through 2021, the PS4 became harder and harder to find, where the Series X is usually outselling it. And then the 3DS, 28,224. Now, that does actually beat out 2020 by just a little bit, about 200,000 units, but it does show Nintendo continuing this uptick 
in Japan. Some of that could be because the OLED launch, which did well across the board, but in Japan obviously did very, very well. I am curious how things will go heading into 2022 where Nintendo themselves are talking about supply shortages. And generally when a system gets over 100 million units, you figure it's going to slow down, especially as we work through like years five and, and then six. Eventually people are just gonna, you're just gonna run out of people to sell to and they're all gonna have Switch systems and wonder what's next. Could be another revision, could be something like a Switch Lite OLED, a lot of possibilities here, but that's kind of what I expect Nintendo to do. Keep business, business as usual, maybe a revision and try to keep this generation going as long as possible until those supply concerns are worked out for their next gen launch. And in the last bit of news, let's talk about E3 2022. Every year, we all look forward to E3. It's a really cool time for gamers since a ton of news and reveals and announcements get packed into like four or five days. But over the last couple of years, E3 has mostly been online or just not happening at all. We did get an update for E3 2022 and it looks like once again, it will be online. We can see this posted up by VentureBeat with a quotation from the ESA saying, due to the ongoing health risks surrounding COVID-19 and its potential impact on the safety of exhibitors and attendees, E3 will not be held in person in 2022. We remain incredibly excited about the future of E3 and look forward to announcing more details soon. So, the, the thing with this is I do wonder how relevant E3 will remain if it has to stay as an online event, even over the next couple of years. They made this announcement now because people are asking, wait, that's not till June. Why would they announce it now? The planning for E3 is months and months in advance. Remember, it's like an entire convention center. They have to set up and pre-plan with a ton of different publishers, exhibitors, the whole thing. So in their mind, if it's, even like 50-50, like maybe it'll happen. It's like, you might as well cancel it now, figure out this whole online thing, which will also take months and months to do and, and organize, and then look forward to maybe 2023. I, the thing with E3 though, is its biggest advantage is that it gathers a lot of developers and publishers into the same place to where like negotiations and Basically, backroom dealings can go on for different things. Remember, we had the whole story around Starlink and how Star Fox got in there. Reggie saw them with their presentation around Starlink, and they were like, hey, that would make sense for Star Fox to be in that. Let's talk about this, right? Because they were in person, they were able to do that. A bit harder when it's just a bunch of Zoom meetings and calls and... You're not gonna be just crossing paths randomly that way. And it's also harder than for people who are going there to interview and ask questions to publishers and developers to get answers to those questions. So unfortunately, I don't know if there's a future for E3 if it's always online and they're not able to bring people together in person. I'd like to think at some point we'll be able to have an in-person event at E3. Nintendo can do their really cool booth with, I don't know, the next Mario or Zelda or, or something. They dress the whole place up in and it can go back to business as usual. But for 2022, looks like we're gonna be seeing another online E3. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're taking a poll that I posted up yesterday where I asked, do you think E3 can survive as an online only event going forward? 31% said yes, 69% said no. All right, so, this is this is going to be tough for E3 to navigate this because basically they have to find their worth now if it is just an online only environment for this show going forward. I mean, why wouldn't the publishers, developers just stream it themselves? Like, why do they need to pay E3 a bunch of money for that platform when Nintendo can go live for Nintendo Direct at any time and have millions of people watching? What benefit does the e, does E3 give them? What benefit does it give Microsoft? Sony already figures there's no benefit. They don't go anymore. So that's E3's biggest struggle right now is to continue to bring publishers in and make them think it's worth being there in the first place and paying them money because from where I'm standing, they don't really need E3 if it's not a big in-person event. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Muhammad saying, I'm really excited for PSVR 2. I have a few already. If Sony can make quality games to compete with Meta and Oculus and make the headset work on PC, they would definitely do well and help make VR more mainstream, which is good for the future of VR. They haven't commented on the PC compatibility for the PlayStation VR 2 yet. I, I almost 
feel like they would have said something, but who knows? There, there's always a possibility that they're saving that for pricing and release date and, and any other games. But yeah, it's going to come down to the games. When they first did PlayStation VR, I do believe they were looking at it as something just to, just to see if there was interest in it. And they sold 5 million headsets at the time. That's very good. The Oculus Quest 2, of course, has set a new standard for it with 10 million sold. But still, PlayStation VR 2, I think, can have a pretty big impact on the VR space if they have the games. You're already sold on it because you have experience with PlayStation VR. That's going to be Sony's biggest hurdle is getting people to try out PlayStation VR 2 because I feel like the experience will be good enough to bring people in and excite them when they try it, but they have to be able to try it first. And with a pretty high price point, is at least what I'm anticipating, and the need for a PS5 in the first place, that might be kind of difficult starting out. And ladies and gentlemen, that's good to hear for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. It really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Where's Konami and their Castlevania 35th anniversary NFTs? What'd you think about that when they announced it? And uh, which franchise do you think they're bringing in next for these NFTs? Let me know about that. And then also, what about E3 as an online event once again? Do you think it can survive with that format going forward? And then Nintendo's New Year's sale. Let me know your best, uh, best suggestions down below in the comments. Thanks, guys, for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time for Newswave.